Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Skidampa Library and Chats with Champions. Chats has a 15-year history of presenting programs that span the interests of all segments of our community. Chats is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop and Cafe. Our next chat is next Tuesday, September 5th at 10 a.m. when New York Times best-selling author Doug Preston will be here to speak about his latest book, The Lost City of the Monkey God. It is an adventure story, a history lesson, and a medical mystery all wrapped into one. Today, we are pleased to present and welcome New York Times best-selling author, Lynn Olson. She will speak about her latest book, Last Hope Island, the story of how Britain and occupied Europe joined forces to combat Nazi Germany, the mightiest military force in history. It is a groundbreaking account of how Britain became an island of refuge for Europeans escape, escaping the blitzkrieg rolling over continental Europe. One of her themes will be, will be an unexplored subject the story has been. No other historian has looked at it in such detail. How Britain, as the last European country to hold out against Hitler, provided a refuge for the leaders of a number of occupied countries, enabling them to set up governments in exile to help defeat Germany. In return, they and thousands of their compatriots made crucial contributions to Britain's survival and the eventual Allied victory. Lynn Olson's books about Britain and America before and during World War II have earned international praise and awards. Former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has called Olson our era's foremost chronicler of World War II politics and diplomacy. In her writing, she has focused on Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as well as ordinary Americans and Britons, to show how these two countries joined together to defeat Hitler. Olson is the author of the national bestseller, Citizens of London, which was named one of the top 10 notable nonfiction books by the American Library Association. She has been a guest on numerous television and radio programs, including The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and NPR, All Things Considered, and Morning Edition. She's a consultant to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. She was born in Hawaii and graduated magna cum laude from the University of Arizona. Before becoming a full-time author, she worked as a journalist for 10 years, first with the Associated Press as a national feature writer in New York, a foreign correspondent in the AP's Moscow Bureau, and a political reporter in Washington. She left the AP to join the Washington Bureau of the Baltimore Sun, where she covered national politics and eventually the White House. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Stanley Cloud, with whom she has co-authored two books. So my pleasure to introduce you. <laughs> Stayed. We, Stan and I are staying in South Bristol for two weeks this week. We have never uh, stayed in South Bristol, but we've been coming up to Maine for the last 30-odd years, and mostly in um, Boothing Harbor area, which I've been told is just anathema here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned that. Uh, and, but we have thoroughly fallen in love with South Bristol and Damariscotta, and largely, and not largely, but uh, we have very, very close friends here, and and you probably, all of you probably know them, and uh, Blackman and Mike Cutzel, who, who Stan and I have known separately and together for the last, uh, I don't even want to say how many years it's been. Stan and I worked together, actually, on um, a feature writing team with the AP, uh, based in New York. I was in New York, she was in Washington, um, but we go back a long way. So um, thank you very much for your hospitality and thank you very much for coming today. Um, in the last 20 years or so, I've written seven books of history. Uh, six of them have focused to a lesser or greater degree on Britain during the late 1930s and early 1940s. 
And I've often been asked why that's so. I've been so interested in this. I'm an American, uh, which Brits keep bringing up all the time when I, when I speak. You know, they seem to find it strange uh, that I have been so interested uh, in this period. And the answer to the question is simple. It was such a dramatic, wonderful historic period, not only for Britain, uh, but for the world. It is, after all, the story of a country's struggle to survive against the strongest military power in history. It's the story of the extraordinary leadership of Winston Churchill and the courage of Brit British citizens in waging that fight. But it's also the story of a city, one that I consider the most spectacular place in the world during that time. And that city, of course, is London. I focused specifically on London in an earlier book called Citizens of London, uh, which some of you may have read. It's an account of the wartime alliance between Britain and the US as told from the point of view of three key Americans who were based there during the war. And one of the main reasons I wrote it is because I wanted to try to capture the excitement and romance and terror and the sheer exhilaration of the place during World War II. So if Citizens of London is about the US and Britain, then Last Hope Island, my latest book, is the story of Britain and occupied Europe. It really begins in one of the darkest times of British history, if not the darkest time, which is the summer of 1940. In the months before that, Nazi Germany had conquered Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and then, to everyone's shock, the greatest prize of all, France. Great Britain was now the last and only hope of freedom and democracy in Europe. Yet although its future looked impossibly bleak at that point, many of its citizens were relieved and even exhilarated that they now stood alone. One person who felt that way was King George VI, who wrote to his mother, Queen Mary, personally, I feel happier now that we have no allies to be polite to. <laughs> <laughs> Winston Churchill, the new British Prime Minister, who had just taken over on May 10th, 1940, was much more of a realist. He knew that whether Britain wanted allies or not, it desperately needed them. The United States, of course, was still neutral then and wasn't ready to do much to help the Brits. So what did Churchill do? To the dismay of many officials in his government, he threw open Britain's doors to the political leaders and armed forces of those European nations that had just been occupied. On June 18, 1940, just before France fell, the new Prime Minister and Commander-in-Chief of Poland, General Władysław Sikorski, flew to London for an urgent meeting with Churchill. At that meeting, he asked if Britain would help rescue the thousands of Polish troops then fighting in France so that they could continue the battle against Germany. Churchill immediately replied, tell your army that we are their comrades in life and death. We shall conquer together or we shall die together. The prime minister then ordered his government to rescue as many foreign troops and airmen fighting in France as possible regardless of their politics or nationality. Thanks to Churchill, London quickly became the wartime refuge for the governments and military of six occupied European countries, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway, Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. The self-appointed representative of Free France, General Charles de Gaulle, the great Charles de Gaulle, also fled there. Most of these exiled leaders had initially resisted leaving their countries uh, for many, many reasons. But one of them is they were horrified by Britain's earlier refusal to confront Hitler and to come to their country's aid. Yet what alternative did they have? Energized in the nick of time by Churchill, Britain was the only nation in Europe still holding out <coughs> against Germany. Only there could the Allied governments join forces and continue the fight. And they did. One of the major points I make in Last Hope Island is that most of these countries did provide substantial aid to the British, which helped save it from defeat, and in the latter part of the war, proved to be of great benefit to the overall Allied victory. Let me give you just a couple of examples. First, Norway. Norway is, as many of you know, if you 
well, you don't even have to go there to know that it's a, a big country geographically. But back then it had a very small population, only three million people. It was extremely important though in one way. It had a huge fleet of merchant ships, the fourth largest fleet in the world and the most modern. At least more than 1,200 ships to the British whose own merchant shipping was being decimated by German submarines. <coughs> With the Norwegian ships and crew at its disposal, Britain was able to keep open the crucial Atlantic lifeline, life which is where they were getting their supplies, and eventually win the Battle of the Atlantic. In early 1941, a British official declared that the Norwegian merchant fleet was worth more to, the, to Britain than an army of a million men. At the same time, the Dutch government contributed to Britain its own sizable merchant fleet of some 600 ships. And then there were the gold reserves of Belgium. If it hadn't been for those reserves, which the Belgian government in exile lent to the British government, Britain could never have stayed financially afloat in 1940 and 1941. And obviously that was before the US got into the war. Besides loaning gold to the UK, the Belgians through their colony in the Congo provided much of the uranium for the Manhattan Project, uh, which was obviously the project that built the first atomic bomb. And then there were the extraordinary spy networks that were operating throughout occupied Europe during the war, collecting intelligence about Germany's military operations in all those countries. Britain's famed MI6 took credit for all this crucial intelligence, but it was actually Europeans who collected it. <laughs> French, Norwegians, Belgian, and the Dutch. But the Poles were head and shoulders above everyone. Years after the war, the British government acknowledged that nearly 50% of the secret information obtained by the Allies from wartime Europe came from Polish sources. <coughs> In 1942, the deputy chief of American military intelligence said about the Poles, quote, they have the best intelligence in the world. Its value for us is beyond compare. There are two other major contributions of the Poles I'd like to mention. One occurred during the Battle of Britain. It's a little known fact that almost 20% of the RAF pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain were from occupied Europe. Most of these were Polish and Czech pilots. In the opinion of a number of Polish officials, a number of, Pol a number of British officials, the contributions of the Polish pilots, more than 100 in all, made the difference between victory and defeat in the battle. Several weeks ago, um, a British newspaper, the, the Mail on Sunday, reviewed my book. Um, and it was a very favorable book review, thank God. And, but my favorite <laughs> comment from it was this. Obviously, writing for a British audience. We might like to believe that the Battle of Britain was won exclusively by jolly good chaps called Douglas and Ginger. <laughs> but in fact, some of our most effective fighter pilots were also called Jan, Josef, and Stanislav. <laughs> and now my final example. Many of you have probably seen the movie Imitation Game, uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch. Great film in, in some ways. According to that film, and according to conventional wisdom, Alan Turing and the code-breaking operation at Bletchley Park were solely responsible for breaking the Germans' Enigma code. In fact, Britain's code-breaking success was due in large part to previous work by the French and, above all, by the Poles. <laughs> According to a top official at Bletchley Park, quote, the ultra-code-breaking operation would never have gotten off the ground if we had not learned from the Poles in the nick of time the details of the Enigma machine and how it was used. The Poles, incidentally, broke the Enigma code. Uh, the Germans had said it would take 900 million years to break it. Uh, the Poles broke it in 1933. And for six years before the war, kept break, I mean, kept, were, in fact, reading um, much of, of Germans' uh, secret information. They realized in, in, you know, by August, July, August of 1939, that they were about to be invaded. Poland was about to be invaded. So they summoned British and French code-breaking officials to their um, code-breaking center outside Warsaw and announced to them that they had been breaking you know, the Enigma for years. And they presented each country with their own copy of the Enigma, Enigma machine. And this is just before uh, Poland uh, was invaded. 
As I said, these are just a few examples of the support provided by the Europeans. There are many, many more. But interestingly and ironically, as Karen said, these contributions have basically been ignored by most historians who generally present the Allied victory in World War II as an American, British, and Soviet triumph. And why is that? Well, once again, Winston Churchill takes center stage because he bears much of the responsibility for that omission. Early in the war, Churchill created this image of plucky little England standing alone against Germany with the help of the nations of the British Empire. It, um, he repeatedly promoted that idea throughout the war and afterwards. And in doing so, he overlooked the fact that the occupied countries from their base in London were still at war too. So that's one of the main reasons I wrote the book, to give credit where credit is due, not only to the governments of occupied Europe, but to individuals in those countries who risked and lost their lives to help the British and defeat the Germans. But I also made clear in Last Hope Island that the occupied countries received a great deal from the British in return. To quote the Mail on Sunday Review again, <coughs> quote, there are moments when Olson's book seems to have little good to say about the British, but she makes it clear that this is not her intention, unquote. And it certainly was not my intention. I really emphasize the fact that both the British and Europeans gained immeasurably from this partnership. Britain's first major gift, of course, was that it gave these European leaders a safe haven when they needed it most. But it also provided hope and inspiration for the millions of people in occupied Europe who didn't have any hope or inspiration in the early years of the war. For Europeans, the mere fact of Britain's continued resistance to Hitler was a sign that not everything was lost. For as long as the war lasted, Many of them took part in a precious nighttime ritual. They took out their radio sets, which had been outlawed by the Germans, from wherever they had hidden them, and turned them on to hear the chiming of Big Ben and the magical words, this is London calling. <laughs> During and after the war, Europeans described those, those secretive moments listening to BBC news programs as their lifeline to freedom. A Frenchman who escaped to London later said, it's impossible to explain how much we depended on the BBC. In the beginning, it was everything. Another escapee, a Belgian journalist who managed to flee from a Nazi concentration camp, arrived in London, as he said, drunk with happiness. Do you know I have been dreaming of this moment for months, he exclaimed to a British friend, adding, millions of people all over the continent are thinking at this very moment of London. A young Polish resistance fighter echoed that sentiment, declaring that getting to London was like getting to heaven. Polish pilots who flew with the Aria during the war referred to Britain as Last Hope Island, and that's where I got the title for the book. So up to this point, I've given you a macro view of this uh, book. It's a bird's eye view of what it's all about. Now I'd like to talk for a couple of minutes about the micro view, which is the human element. This is an amazingly rich human story with an enormous cast of wonderful larger-than-life characters. Um, in all my books, I, I try very hard, both Stan and I um, have tried hard to insert that human element all, all the way through. So we focus on characters, we focus on human beings, human beings make history. Uh, and, and this book was just full of them. Some are well known, like Charles de Gaulle, but most are not. They range from kings and queens to scientists, spies, and saboteurs. One of the major characters, for example, is the king of Norway, King Haakon VII, who showed extraordinary courage during the war and became the focal point of his country's resistance movement. He's, as I said, he is one of the central characters. He's particularly fascinating because he was not even Norwegian. Um, he was Danish, and, uh, and he, his name was not Hawken, his name was uh, Carl, Charles, um, and he was the second son of the king of, um, of Denmark. Uh, his grandfather was the king of Sweden and Norway, um, and Norway in its wonderful way, Norway is a fabulous country, 
Norway, in its wonderful way, decided it wanted to be free of Sweden. It was kind of a confederation, but the Swedes ruled. And so they announced that they were going to, uh, they wanted their independence, um, but they weren't going to fight for it. They, they, they announced that they would, take a, they would take a king, and it could be from the Swedish royal family. Um, but other than that, they got their independence. And, and, and it worked. Well, the only problem was that they, you know, there, there was only one suitable candidate, and that was Carl, who desperately wanted nothing to do with being a king. And he said he was the second son, so he wasn't going to be king of Denmark. Um, and he was married to the daughter of King Edward VII, Bertie, you know, the uh, victorious son uh, of England, and she didn't want to be a queen. And, and so <laughs> they, they fought really hard against this, but he was basically forced by his grandfather and uh, other members of the Swedish and Danish royal families to take it. He had been a, 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 a he had belonged to the, the, uh, the Danish Navy, and that's what he wanted to do for the rest of his life, is to be a sailor. Um, so anyway, he was forced into this job, and he considered himself an out outsider from the beginning. He spoke no Norwegian. Um, <laughs> and so he and his wife, whose name was Maud, and uh, so Carl took the name Hagen, which is an old, ancient uh, Norwegian royal name, um, and Queen Maud would have nothing to do with taking another name. She, so she was Queen Maud until the day she died. Um, but so he, as I said, he basically felt like an outsider. I get it. I won't go into any more detail, but I get it into the book how he went from being an outsider to the most uh, loved person in Norway. And then toward the end of his life, after the war, he survived. Um, he. Um, the one thing he wanted in the whole world was a sailboat, and he asked uh, this before the war. He asked um, the the government, the parliament, you know, if he could, they would give him money for a sailboat. They said no. <laughs> and after the war, the, the entire country chipped in for I think it was his 78th birthday, and they bought him a yacht. Oh. <laughs> and he used it until the day he died. Um, Another major character is the Earl of Suffolk, who is a swashbuckling English aristocrat who rescued two nuclear scientists from France just before it fell. Those two scientists later went on to play a crucial role in developing the first atomic bomb. And then there's a beautiful young French spy named Jean Rousseau, who flirted with German officers in Paris to find out their secrets about Hitler's new terror weapons, the V-1 flying bomb and the V-2 rocket. I also write about some really interesting bit players, including a teenage Audrey Hepburn, who served as a courier for the Dutch resistance, mm -hmm. and four-year-old Madelinka Corbell, the daughter of a Czech government official in London who survived the Blitz and grew up to become U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Oh. <laughs> and then there is probably my favorite character in the book, Queen Wilhelmina of Holland. Mm -hmm. At that point, when the war began, she had been queen for 49 years. She had assumed the throne at the age of 10. <laughs> Wilhelmina's life up to that point had been extremely frustrating. She grew up in what she despairingly called the cage, which was her name for the oppressive, formal, strict atmosphere of the Dutch royal court. She was raised with almost no friends or companions her own age. When she went skiing in the, uh, ski, skating in the winter, the canals in Amsterdam were cleared of people, and she was forced to skate alone. She was once overheard scolding one of her dolls, if you are naughty, I shall make you into a queen. <laughs> and then you won't have any other little children to play with. Wilhelmina's dream from her childhood was to perform what she called great deeds, like those of her famed royal ancestors, King William the Silent, who led Holland's fight for independence against Spain in the 16th century, and William of Orange, the famous William of Orange, who became King of England as well as Holland and defended both countries against the French. But she saw no possibility of fulfilling that dream. As her government ministers repeatedly made clear to her, she no longer possessed the power of William of Orange and her other famed predecessors. Since the mid-19th century, Holland, like France, I mean, not Holland, like Britain, uh, and Norway had been a constitutional monarchy, which meant that Wilhelmina, to her great frustration, had almost no power. She had the right to encourage and warn her government and to be consulted and informed. But the leaders of the coalition governments that presided over the country in those pre-war years uh, never consulted her. And when she gave them unsolicited advice, 
They usually paid little or no attention. This really made her angry. She had a real temper. Um, and as I, I quote Winston Churchill in the book as saying after the war, there, there was um, no man I feared more than Queen Wilhelmina. <laughs> So she was angry, but there wasn't much she could do about it. That is, not until her country was invaded by Germany in World War II. From London, she became the center and soul of Holland's resistance. Over the BBC, she delivered passionate, fiery anti-Nazi broadcasts to her government and to her countrymen. The Dutch found it impossible to believe that this was the same remote, aloof queen who had ruled them for more than 40 years. And her first broadcast, made from Buckingham Palace, on the day after she arrived in England, she made it clear she would never compromise with Hitler, whom she called the arch enemy of mankind. Mm -hmm. One Dutch writer later made the comment, her speeches were highlights in our lives, especially when she attacked the Germans and the Dutch Nazis. During the war, a joke made the rounds in Holland that Wilhelmina's young granddaughters were forbidden to listen to her on the radio because she used such foul language when she <laughs> talked about the Nazis. When German authorities confiscated her palaces and other possessions in Holland to, in retaliation for her anti-Nazi attacks, Wilhelmina, in her next broadcast, vented her anger at, in what German translators called amazingly heated swear words. <laughs> but Wilhelmina did more than speak. Early in the war, several members of the Dutch government in exile in London, including the Prime Minister, wanted to approach Hitler to seek a separate peace. Mm -hmm. Wilhelmina was determined to fight on. Quite remarkably, she informed the Prime Minister that she had lost all confidence in him. He promptly offered his resignation, which to her surprise, she immediately accepted. <laughs> to his surprise, she immediately accepted. Such a display of queenly displeasure would never have been successful at home in Holland, where she had no real authority and the cabinet and parliament ruled. But in London, there was no parliament. The cabinet now had to take her views into account. For Wilhelmina, exile meant power, and she took full advantage of it. When she named a new prime minister, she appointed the only member of the government whom she thought shared her fierce hatred of the Nazis and determination to fight them to the end. In doing all this, Wilhelmina did in fact achieve her greatest childhood ambition, to perform great deeds. Those victories, however, were not won on the battlefield, like those of her ancestors, <coughs> during her London exile. In a never to be repeated moment, a modern ruler of the, ne the Netherlands was given the chance to exercise real leadership, and Wilhelmina made the most of it. Just as with Winston Churchill and the British, World War II was her finest hour. She stopped her defeatist government from capitulating, kept Holland in the fight, and inspired and united her people. In doing all this, as one Dutch historian said, she won a place in Dutch history, second to none. Thanks to her wartime stay in London, Wilhelmina and the other European leaders were able to continue their fight against Hitler. But those five years together, gave the Europeans something else, an unprecedented opportunity to form close personal and official connections with one another. The trauma of defeat and occupation had convinced them that their nations must band together after the war. After the war. The Europe hoped to achieve any kind of future influence, strength, and security. Their cooperation in London planted the seeds for the campaign for European unification that followed the war an extraordinary effort that helped lead to more than half a century of peace and prosperity for Western Europe. The leaders of that movement hoped that the, that the British, who had given them refuge when they needed it most, would take the lead in uniting post-war Europe. But Britain, as the German Chancellor, Billy Brandt, later noted, was reluctant to, quote, renounce the insularity of its past greatness. <laughs> Instead, it returned to its traditional aloofness, drawing a veil over its wartime partnership with Europe. It continued, um, it, it continued to promote the image created by, Britain continued to promote the image created by Churchill that it had stood alone against the Nazis until the Soviet Union and the United States entered the conflict in 1941. 
1973, Britain did join the European Economic Community, which is the forerunner of the European Union, primarily so it could reap the considerable uh, economic benefits of European free trade. But having done so, it never fully reconciled itself to the idea that it was part of Europe. Its uneasiness over those ties increased as the continent's economic success story faded. The vote of British citizens last year to leave the EU, as you well know, has presented the UK, as well as a fragile Europe, with enormous problems and challenges. Nonetheless, for all of the post-war divisions, the glow of those crucial war years when Britain welcomed occupied Europe to its shores has never dimmed. To the French journalist Yves Curie, the daughter of Nobel laureates Marie and Pierre Curie, and an exile herself, the grandeur of wartime Britain was embodied by Churchill and the Europeans who joined him in, joined him in London, whom she described as all those insane, unarmed heroes who defied the triumphant Hitler. Churchill and Roosevelt, did they <coughs> pull these exiled leaders into their decision-making process, or were they kept at a distance? That's a really, really good question. I can get into it in the book. Uh, the answer is no, they did not. Um, uh, particularly, it, it, even when it was just written by itself, uh, the Brits tried, they ran into a lot of bumps if you read the book. I mean, the, the, the relationship between the exiles and the British was not all that great in the beginning. Uh, it, it became better as the war went on. I mean, the British have this, do have this very kind of infuriating, insular attitude that they know better than everybody else. They still do to some extent. Um, and, um, and they didn't really understand the problems of what, and nobody did, unless, unless your country is occupied, unless you've experienced firsthand, you just have no idea what it's like, and especially with the Nazis. So that there were problems, but when the U.S. got into the war, um, and that's what Churchill's main goal was all along, is to get the U.S. into the war. Roosevelt made it very clear that he wanted nothing to, that, you know, that there were the big three. Um, there was the U.S., there was Britain, and there was the Soviet Union, and he didn't want to give any decision-making power to any of those smaller allies. So their, their stock started going down. Even though they had made all these contributions, um, Roosevelt really didn't care. And so they, they had very, very little say in the decision making. Um, and, and you know, obviously one of the, 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 most, um, the most obvious example, one of them, is the way that Roosevelt in particular uh, shunned de Gaulle. You know, it made it very clear he wanted nothing to do with de Gaulle. He, didn't, he wouldn't let French forces participate in the landing in French North Africa. Uh, he wouldn't let French forces uh, that there were no French forces on D-Day. Um, in fact, they didn't even tell de Gaulle until like two days before that they were about to invade France. Um, so, you know, de Gaulle was a royal pain. Now, there's no question, and he was an incredibly difficult man. But the way he was treated by Roosevelt and, and to some extent by Churchill, who, who didn't want to do that, but he basically felt he had to follow the leader of Roosevelt was quite shameful. And, and it still has had, it had harmful effects uh, after the war, and it's still that the ramifications of that, um, of what happened. I mean, de Gaulle never forgave either France or Britain, and uh, I mean, the US or Britain. And, and basically, France, the, the kind of thorny relationship between France and the US has its roots in what happened during the war. Um, I was really moved by your description of the suffering of the Poles. And especially a little disappointed, I guess, at how they were so abandoned when the US Army was right outside the gates, if you like. And, and I, I started to think about the context of today and, and how we feel about helping mm -hmm. other nations. I just wonder if you could comment more on that. That was, I thought, and, yeah, I mean, what happened to Poland and Czechoslovakia at the end of the war? Obviously, that they were um, abandoned by the uh, the other allies and and were basically handed over to Soviet rule. Um, 
it's just a little background. I mean, basically, Church, Roosevelt, again, didn't really care what happened to Poland. Churchill uh, did because, because of the contributions of, of the Poles, but also because England had gone to war supposedly over Poland. You know, when, when the Germans invaded Poland, that's when Brit and Britain and France went to war. And so they, they had obligations, the British did. Um, but, but Roosevelt, again, um, was the leader in all this, and he, he basically, all he cared about were Polish votes. He really did not care about what happened to Poland. You know, it, it's part of, of where we as Americans live. I mean, we live in this incredibly blessed country until fairly recently where there was no, um, well, that, that actually, I, that was really not meant as a political comment. <laughs> until 9-11. I mean, we had never, the mainland had never been attacked. But obviously Pearl Harbor had, but the mainland had really never been attacked. So we had no concept of what it's like to live on a, a continent where the, the threat of attack is always there. And, and, and even Britain didn't have it, because Britain, even though it is, you know, part of Europe, it's still separated by the English Channel, which is a very uh, why, but it has proved to be a potent barrier for 800 years. Um, so the, the Brits don't have the same, they don't really know what it's like either, but we certainly have been, you know, two oceans on either side of us. And, and then there was a thought that we shouldn't, you know, I could go into a long detail about this because I read about it, but we shouldn't get involved in, in other people's problems, certainly the Europeans. Um, so it, it, it's something that's still with us, you know, and, and probably will. All the time. Yes. After the war, Queen Wilhelmina, uh, did she go back to being kind of a passive queen or did she continue to kick ass? Well, <laughs> she wanted to continue to kick ass. She hoped that, she hoped that when she went back, but when she was in, in London, the people that she hung out with were not, certainly not members of her, her government or you know, people, businessmen who managed to go there. She didn't want anything to do. She hung out with the young um, guys who escaped. The, 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 they were called England barbers, the, you know, the England fairers. They were yeah, mostly men, but there were some women who, who escaped from Holland and made their way to Britain. And um, so those are the people she wanted to be with. I mean, she wanted to be with the rebels. She wanted to, you know, be with the resistance fighters. Um, and when she went back, she, like many of her, the people who had, who were in the resistance, uh, hoped that all of what happened, you know, the war, that, that things would be so, to would be totally different, that there would be a new sense of justice, you know, the, you know, sense of, of uh, equality and fighting for equality and, and up, you know, an upheaval in society. That did not happen in most countries to her and others great disappointment. Basically, the people in those countries would live through five, four, five, six years of Hitler, of uh, Nazi occupation, five years, um, just wanted life to go back to normal. They wanted to, be eat, to eat, you know, to be able to have a car, have their kids go to school. They just wanted life to be what it was before. And so for a number of years, life did not change. Um, but gradually, as, as I, I think I quote Ian Baruma, the Dutch writer, who said after the chaos and catastrophe of what they had just uh, experienced, life couldn't be the same. And, and slowly these young resistance members started taking over governments. I mean, for example, you know, in France, the, uh, some of the, uh, the fathers of the, of the European movement, of the European Union, um, had been involved in the resistance in France, or had been with de Gaulle. Um, so it gradually changed, but unfortunately it didn't change fast enough for Wilhelmina. She was in her late 60s when she went back. She um, did go back and then unfortunately had to become again, you know, a constitutional monarch. She actually abdicated uh, three years after she returned. She was, I guess, in her late 60s, early 70s. Um, in, in her daughter um, became the queen, and uh, she basically retired to a small house. She, uh, when she went back, she lived in, uh, reluctantly in the palaces, but she she did wouldn't turn on the heat uh, because <laughs> people in the Netherlands didn't have heat. She would bicycle around uh, Holland just you know to meet people, and uh, she uh, there, there's a wonderful uh, the, the young um, freedom fighter. Dutch freedom fighter, who she became very close friends with, who was her aide-de-camp, and he wrote a wonderful memoir in which he talked about 
how she, she had always wanted to be like regular people, and, and in London she finally was able to do that. Um, and then, so when she went back, she wanted to be treated like a regular person, but the Dutch would have nothing to do with it. And they bowed, and you know, they, uh, you know, they scraped, and she hated that. She just hated it, but that's the way they were. So she advocated uh, in 1948. She lived for another 15 years. She, she moved into a small house, um, not even a, she refused to, uh, to stay in a palace, uh, a small house, and, and she basically uh, painted and, and babysat her granddaughters. That's, uh, that's how she is. Uh, but uh, a simple, simply stunning woman. Uh, you know, what she accomplished was amazing. Yes? Uh, you mentioned you mentioned the movie The Imitation Game mm -hmm. uh, and not acknowledging the Polish contribution. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the recent success, Dunkirk, which, uh, other than a brief uh, scene yeah. in which the French and the British is some tension, you would not know, yeah. I think, that the British Expeditionary Force was mostly Indian, yeah. that the RAF was Polish mm -hmm. and Czech, as you noted. But, What's your thoughts but, on that? Uh, you make a very, very good point. The, the, the thing with that movie is, uh, I mean, I, that wasn't the type of movie I don't think the director was trying to make. He was trying to put you in, you know, what it's like in war, and I think he did a really good job. Right. At Dunkirk, actually, most of the British forces were white and they were British. Uh, there, I don't, there were very, very few Indian troops at Dunkirk, and and um, and at that point, the Poles weren't fighting. This was, you know, before. This is just as France was falling. So the the occupied Europeans were in France. They were fighting in France. They were hoping to that France would hang on, it didn't. And, then, and after France fell, that's when they all came over. Um, but in, in the context of that movie, um, I think he is, he's accurate in terms of who participated. You have a really good point, though, about the French. He did, he did as you said, that he bowed to the fact there's one scene, for those of you who have seen it, uh, uh, where French troops are trying to get on a, a ship. And, uh, British guards are preventing them and saying it's only for British. And that's what happened originally. I mean, in the first few days of Dunkirk, of the evacuation, only British troops were allowed off. The British didn't even tell the French that they were doing this until two days after it began. I mean, it was obvious to the French that something was going on because they're all leaving. Um, but they didn't, they didn't formally inform the French government that they were, in fact, back evacuating. Eventually, by order of Churchill, they started taking on French troops, and more than 100,000 did escape. The ironic thing is they went up to Britain, and when, when France capitulated, most of them wanted to go back. I mean, they, they wanted nothing to do with de Gaulle at that point. Um, so, uh, but the French were, you know, the French did go on, but they should have done more. Actually, if you remember the last scene in the movie, not the last scene, the last scene is that wonderful aerial. Uh, battle, but the scene where Kenneth Branagh is, uh, there are only two officers left, and, and one says, well, let's go, and he yeah. says, no, I'm, I'm staying for the French. And, and so he he acknowledged that, in fact, that they had screwed the French, basically, and they did. Yes, sir. Did you uh, have occasion to uh, look at a book about uh, the use of, uh, of female spies that were dropped into France? And every single one of them was uh, met by the Germans because they had been informed, apparently, by the British own male secret service that these women were, were being dropped in, and every one of them was killed in uh, uh, well, a I, way. I have not seen that book. There were a lot of women. These were members of the SOE Special Operations Executive, which was the British sabotage and subversion agency, and there it, there were a lot of women in that. It was the, pretty much the only um, British agency that had a lot of women, wartime agency. Um, and there were a lot who did go into France, and some of them um, were killed. That, that's not right. They didn't drop in and were immediately uh, captured and, and, and killed. Most of them actually did work, you know, for some for not very long, uh, but there was I write a lot about this in the book. The SOE and MI6 were criminally um, um, confident about themselves and thinking that the Germans 
didn't know anything. You know, that they didn't know anything about counterintelligence. The Germans had the best counterintelligence uh, agents in, in throughout occupied Europe. They were fantastic. Um, and and so thinking that, blankly thinking that they could keep sending agents in, and sending agents in, and sending agents in, and they were told, they were warned often um, that the things were really bad in Holland, Holland and France. This is particularly true. Um, in Holland, uh, fairly early on, the Germans figured out what was going on. They started capturing these um, SOE agents coming in, including radio <coughs> operators. They turned them and had the radio operators, you know, reporting back to London. And um, the head of SOE's coding department realized what was going on and warned his superiors, and the superiors said, you know, we don't believe it. And so Holland, over a course of about a year and a half, 58, this is where this did happen, 50 agents were parachuted in and they were met by the Gestapo and the Abwehr, and they were immediately imprisoned, and almost all of them were killed um, toward the end of the war. Uh, but but if, if that's what that book says, it's not, it's not accurate. Yes? <clears throat> My husband and I lived in London for eight years in the 90s and early 2000s, and um, some of our neighbors were, we had a retired RAF pilot and three retired couples on our street, and they all um, articulated how much the country pulled together, and in some ways it was their finest days. They were tough and resilient people, and 50, 60, 59, 60 nights of constant um, bombardment by the Nazis, I right. mean, that is determination to get through it. But we also s sensed that they were not keen on building the Channel Tunnel, uh -huh. uh, which was completed, I think, in 1994, uh -huh. because they like to keep their distance from, they would say, over in York, yeah. as if yeah. they weren't part of the continent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they like to keep their distance because throughout their history, they feel that everything bad came from Europe. So, there. You, you summed it up brilliantly. That's yeah. Exactly. And that's still, obviously it still right. goes on. I mean, you know, we were, Stan and I were just in London a month ago, and um, it, it's really extraordinary. I mean, it's, London is this, this little, it's not, it's this huge bastion of cosmopolitanism and inter, you know, multiculturalism, and, you know, God, it's just so vibrant and exciting. But when you get outside London, um, not all of, of, of the UK, but most of the UK, um, it still feels that way. I mean, it, it, they have the strangest, the weirdest way of looking at their relationship with Europe. It, it, Churchill summed it up, he said, um, we are with Europe, but not of Europe. Yes. You know, like, yes. you, they are Europeans, they, I mean, they really are, they're not physically connected to the continent, but they, but they refuse to, you know, acknowledge it. And that's still, that, that, that's the, that same insularity still is, uh, is still very much there. Yes. And to their, to their great dismay, I mean, to their great, uh, I think, harm, I think Brexit is just the worst thing in the world that could have happened, not only to Britain, but to Europe and the rest of the world, but there we are. Yes? Uh, actually, I have two questions. One. Were there people from the Greek government in exile in London? And secondly, what was Prince Philip's world in World War II? You got me on the second one. I don't know. He was, he was um, I think he was maybe in Greece. I'm not sure exactly where he was at that point. I mean, he was obviously a young, maybe was he British? I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Let's answer your second question. Um, the, <coughs> I got, the Greeks. I did not include two countries in this, and, and thank I was expecting a real blowback. And I, in my uh, in my office, and I explained why I didn't do it. Um, there were two other countries whose governments left, and that was Greece and Yugoslavia, and that happened in 1941. You know, a year after these countries that I talk about came to London in 1940. Um, I believe the Greek government in exile actually went to Egypt. Um, so they did not come to London. The Yugoslav uh, government in exile did come to London in 1941. Um, but there were a number of reasons why I didn't include them. First, it came late later. Second, they really didn't have that much of an impact. The government did not have that much of an impact on their country or in London, even though there were a lot of, as you probably know, the Yugoslav partisans led by Tito and, and other rival groups. 
um, you know, did engage with the Nazis, and so the, the Soviet, uh, the Brits sent a lot of both material help and SOE agents in to help them. And, but the main reason is the book was so overwhelming by that point anyway that, that I just didn't want to include any more going. <laughs> <laughs> more things are enough. And you said this, uh, those are the your two questions. Yeah, I can't, I can't answer the ones out the middle. Can you give us a timeline of the Soviet involvement in the war and the extent of which that might have relieved pressure on Britain? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the timeline is that Germany invade uh, up to that point is you, you may know that in 1939, the Soviets and Germans signed a non-aggression pact. And that really opened the door for Hitler to start World War II. Uh, that was in August of 1939. So basically, the Soviets became an undeclared ally of the Germans. I mean, they supposedly were in trouble, but they were, they were handing over a lot of, of natural resources. And, you know, and they were saying that we're not going to get involved. And, you know, you, you can go ahead and invade all these Eastern Europe countries that we won't bother you, which is what happened. Then in June 1941, Hitler launched a surprise attack against the Soviet Union. Uh, and the Soviets should have been expecting it. I mean, it's, it was clear that that was probably going to be coming, but Stalin was just paralyzed for days. And it looked like it was going to be, you know, the, 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 the Germans were just going to roll over the, the Soviets and be done, and everybody thought it would be done in two months. But as history has pointed out, the Russians always have surprises for Napoleon and anybody else who, and that was true. Um, for the, and the Brit, yes. Um, and, and so they held out, um, barely for months and even a year, but barely. Uh, and then they started getting a lot of aid from the U.S. and that helped. And so, um, the Soviets, the reason why Poland and Czechoslovakia and the rest of Eastern Europe ended up with the Soviets is because of what the Soviets did during the war. Um, this, without the Soviets, uh, we probably wouldn't have won the war. They, they, they bore the brunt of the fighting. The fighting on the Eastern Front was so far, uh, was so enormous compared to what was going on on the Western Front. I mean, I have focused only on the Western Front when I, when I write, but, and, uh, uh, only now historians are really paying a huge amount of attention to the Eastern Front. And it was, I mean, it was astronomical. Um, you know, the numbers of lives lost and, and the scope of the fighting in Russia and, and um, in, you know, that, in the, that area. Um, so, what Roosevelt particularly and Churchill too, they were desperate to keep Stalin in the war and to keep the, um, the, the Soviets you know, fighting, because that obviously took a lot of pressure off um, American and British troops. Um, and so there was always this push-pull throughout the war of Stalin, once he was in the war, Stalin pressuring, 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 pressuring Roosevelt and Churchill to do more, um, to, to have a second front. When he meant a second front, he didn't mean in North Africa or in Italy, he meant in France and, and you know, to get into to Europe, so to relieve the pressure on its own troops. So there was always that back and forth between them, and then throughout the war, starting in 1943, that's when Roosevelt, and then followed by Churchill, started saying, okay, whatever you want in Poland. They didn't say it like that, but I mean, they started making promises, secret promises to Stalin that he would probably end up with what he wanted, which is, which is mostly Poland, but much of the rest of Eastern Europe as well. Yes, can you talk a little bit about um, Roosevelt and at least from my impression of his deviousness and manipulating people yeah. and whether it be Churchill or De Gaulle or Congress. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I, I can go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a lot about Roosevelt and I have a reputation of being anti-Roosevelt and, and I, I keep saying well, maybe to some extent I am, but I, I keep saying that Roosevelt, I think Roosevelt was a great president. There's no question. But presidents aren't great all the time. And, and I, you know, he was brilliant in terms of, of, of the challenges of the Depression and the New Deal and basically saved our country, I think. Um, but I don't think he was all, he was as good in World War II. He was good in some aspects of World War II, leading, leading our country, but in terms of his relationships with some of the world leaders. 
Um, he was devious, and he prided himself on his deviousness. He once said, I can't remember the exact quote, but I never, know my, I never let my left hand know what my right hand is doing. You know, so he, uh, he, he delighted in fooling people, in, in making them, uh, you know, in he, I mean, he was a spectacular liar. He was really good at it. Um, and, um, and he was, he had this idea, and this goes back again, I think, to um, being American. He had this idea that he could know, he, he was a great charmer. I mean, he obviously, we know that. Uh, he was an extraordinarily gifted politician, perhaps our most gifted politician in terms of presidents. Um, but he had this idea that he could charm anybody, that he didn't have to know them, he didn't have to know anything about them. And Stalin was a prime example. He thought he knew nothing about Soviet history. He knew nothing about, you know, czarism and how basically the communists were the new czars. He knew nothing about that. He, um, he didn't. He, I guess probably knew, but didn't care that you know, Stalin, you know, killed millions of his own people. Um, but he thought that he could make friends with them. That they just needed to get together, and he could he could make friends with them. And that was his viewpoint. And so anything the Russians wanted, anything Stalin wanted, he was prepared to give it to him. There were many in his government, particularly in the military, who were appalled by this, um, and constantly warned him that the Soviets only understand strength. You know, they you know they if you give in, they're going to keep taking and taking and taking. And and but he, he never really learned. But he was he was extraordinary. Um, you know, just the, his health. His health started going downhill starting in 1941, and by 1943 he was in really bad shape. And he runs he runs again in 1944, and he and his staff do their best to hide the fact that the man is dying. I mean, he clearly was. It took him. You know, it was another six months before he died after 19, the election of 1944. But he was in no shape to you know to have another term. But they they took ex, you know elaborate. Um, deceptive measures to make sure that the American people didn't know he was in. Do you get into anything about the relationships uh, of uh, Spain or Portugal or Ireland, for that matter? No, I don't. Um, I you know that again. This book is already so big. Um, I, I mentioned um, the fact that they were neutral. It's a great story. I mean, the story of the neutral countries and their role in the war is, is just a fantastic story. Um, but I don't cover it. In the book. Maybe your next book. <laughs> you know, I've often thought about it, but I have to have a chronology. I mean, it's hard to write that. I've, I've learned um, that it's, unless you have a chronology, a story, a narrative, it's you know, it's really hard to. I and mean, people have done it. People have done it brilliantly. But if you just have this topic. You know, okay, neutrality, and I guess you could do chronic, it, but it, I don't think I could do it. It's not for me. To, uh, to defend FDR for a moment. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, he's, as you said, he's been acute at being devious and lying and been accused of selling Eastern European, Eastern Europe out, especially mm -hmm. Yalta, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, given where the Soviet army, I mean, was, and, and is there any real, was there any yeah. real choice that Stalin would have retreated? No, at that point there wasn't. And, and I'm not saying, quite frankly, um, that, that there was anything that could be done finally because of, I mean, you know, the Soviets were, had, had contributed greatly to the victory, and they, they were right on the doorstep of, of Poland. But Sam and I wrote a, a separate book of, just about the Poles in World War II, and, um, they never even tried. I mean, at a point, I'm not even saying that Poland could have remained independent, but perhaps they could have been like a Finland, you know, where the, um, you know, where they were, the, the control wasn't so total. Uh, in, in the early days after the um, Soviet Union had been invaded, they, they were on the ropes. I mean, Russia was really on the ropes. And at that point, and, and there were some people that argued that pressure should be put on Saudi. Okay, quid pro quo. Um, you know, we are, are not going to agree. He wanted them to agree immediately that, that uh, the Soviet Union would take over half of Poland at that point. And um, so basically saying, okay, we'll help you, but you know, this is going to, we're not going to allow you to do this. Um, but they didn't. And, and by the time um, that they actually started talking even secretly about it, you're right. The, the Soviet, Soviet troops 
were in a position where it would, it would have been impossible to kick them out without going to war again. And then there's no way that neither of those leaders or countries were prepared to do that. Um, but I'm just saying that there are things, nothing was tried. Basically what we say in the book is nobody even tried to do anything, you know, to, to help preserve even a modicum of independence or a modicum of freedom for these people, especially the Poles who did so much um, to help win that war and that were treated really badly. What was the role of Romania and Bulgaria? Well, Romania and Bulgaria, I mean, you're asking me questions of, you know, are kind of the silo. They, they were uh, basically in the German orbit. You know, they were basic, they were, uh, um, they were run by fascists, and, uh, it, it, and yeah, they were basically under Hitler. Yes? Without the Lend-Lease program, what would happen with Russia? Ah, see, well, that's, that's the point. Without the Lend-Lease program, Russia would have gone down the tubes. Um, and Stalin, in fact, at one point, in one of the, one of the uh, uh, summits, made, in fact, got up and made a toast and said that without the help, he did, I don't know if he said Lend-Lease, but without the U.S. help in terms of material supplies, weapons, uh, they, they could never have survived. And it's true. It's true. So there was, you know, there were kind of... Uh, things that Roosevelt could have done, I think, early on. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I love all your books. I, I, so two questions. In The Citizens of London, Master uh, Minor comes out of such an incredible era. Um, and then he's almost immediately forgotten and never heard of. Yeah. yeah. And there's also a rumor I heard in New York that, that you're a relative of his. So, oh, gosh, no, I wish I were. <laughs> Gil Minot's story is one of the great stories of all time, and the fact that he's uh, not well known. Uh, but fingers crossed, um, there might be a future film made of that book, and he, he will be the he will be the hero of the book. I mean, right. film. So it's it's not done, but it's on its way, so we'll see. Thank you. Oh.